Hi everyone, this is Britt Simon. Uh, I think I'm live, um, so with a bit of luck. And um, I, I'm using a new microphone. I'm hoping it's working well. Perhaps somebody could confirm that they uh, that they're hearing me well. I want to, you know, just test that out. But um, but I did want to address a couple of things. Um, and so for the time being, actually, uh, let's get you to hold your questions. Hold your questions um, because I'm going to talk about a couple of things first. Okay. So, um, comments, yeah, hi, hi, everyone. Uh, could someone just give me, oh, that's a yep, yeah, yeah, loud and clear. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Kumar. Okay, so, um, so I, I wanted to address a couple of things because I think there are some, probably some misconceptions. I believe they're misconceptions about what's going to happen over the next couple of weeks after the lawsuit win. Um, there seems to be a perspective, even amongst some of the lawyers, that the world is suddenly going to change and be a happy place, and um, and the government are going to say, okay, fair fair play, we're going to open up all the embassies, and we're going to process people who are not documentarily qualified, and we're going to issue twenty thousand visas. That's not going to happen, right? That's not going to happen. We we need to be somewhat realistic about what's going to happen in the next couple of weeks. So let me let me talk about that first and foremost, right? I've said for some time if, if you've listened to my um, to my videos over recent weeks, I've said um, that the most important thing at this point is the preservation order at the end of the month, right? I believed for some time that we were going to get that preservation order and we will do, I believe still, uh, the 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 opinion from Judge Meta has made it clear that he's going to calculate that at um, uh, once he's got the September twenty third report and and he understands better what progress has been made as a result of his order, but also as a result of the uh, regular processing, right? So he's inclined to preserve visas for DV twenty twenty one just as he did for DV twenty twenty. And just as he's given, giving permission, he hasn't arranged it yet, but he's giving permission for those visas to be granted from DV 2020, there'll also be some sort of arrangement with the government, some sort of discussion, some sort of agreement, etc., and ultimately a decision from Judge Meta, if necessary, about how and when the DV 2021 process um, can resume. Will it be immediately after September 30th? Will it be, uh, you know, will it just continue from that point? We don't know yet, right? But it's unlikely to be um, an immediate overnight thing from September 30th when I think he'll probably issue the order September 29th or 30th, just as a guess. Um, and, uh, you know, it's unlikely the next day that everybody's going to just continue doing DV 2021 interviews. That won't happen, right? Um, it, it will take some time for that to be worked out. And it can take, you know, it could take several weeks even. Um, the government uh, the government didn't cooperate on DV 2021, even af after the judge told them, look, you're going to lose this case or you've lost this case. We're going to issue those 9,095 visas. Just tell us how and when you want to do that. The government came back with a stupid suggestion. And so, you know, that that takes time to resolve, right? Okay, so... That's about the preservation. I wanted that to happen. It's going to happen. Um, that's great news, right? So what I want to talk about now is what's going to happen between now and the end of the month, because I think you're all going to drive yourself nuts when, um, you know, when we don't see thousands of interviews being arranged in the next few days. And that won't happen, right? And, and, and as I say, some people are frankly in fairy tale land if they think that's going to happen. And let me explain why that won't happen. First, firstly, the judge's order came out yesterday and was given to the to the lawyers, right? Um, KCC and the embassies won't know anything about it yet. They're probably starting to hear something about it now, um, but not formally. Um, and the, you know the the the, um, uh, the government won't have told KCC or the embassies anything about how to process cases and how to change their behaviour and anything else. So that's going to take a few days for that to be to be organized, right? And it, we saw this last year. It took uh, from September 4th when we get the order 
It was September 7th, I think, thereabouts, uh, before anything was published by the government and um, in terms of instructions to the embassies. It takes some time. So figure on a few days for that, right? The next thing is, contrary to last year, last year the embassies were doing no visa interviews for no cases, right? And we got an order that, uh, that made it possible for DV interviews to happen uh, in consulates which were otherwise doing almost no work, right? That's very different to this year, where the consulates have already booked up their September interviews for not only DV cases, but also all the other cases. And they were treating DV as um, tier four, meaning uh, whatever time was left after they'd served all their other visa customers, they could put some, some effort into DV cases. And they gave, the, uh, they gave KCC an idea of their capacity and KCC filled up those visa, visa slot, slots, right? Based on who's documentarily qualified. Now, the order from Judge Mehta does not say that the DV cases are mission critical. That's important. All he said is that the prioritization scheme, the DV, uh, DV visas being at tier four, um, are no longer to be treated in that way. But he hasn't said that they're to be you know, treated as the most important things, mission critical. So they're not going to go and cancel interviews for other types of visas in September in order to make way for DV cases. They're not. They're just not going to do that, right? And so, uh, and even if they did that, um, they, uh, you know, th there's a sort of a, there's a natural sort of uh, limit to how many uh, interviews any particular consular can take, which is also partly based on the capacity of the physicians doing the, um, doing the medical interviews or the medical screening prior to the interviews, right? So between now and the end of the month, the physicians could be fully booked up or have, you know, limited capacity. So even if you have 100 consular officers standing in a in a otherwise empty consulate waiting to interview all of the DV cases they can possibly do, how many doctors can, uh, you know, can, can actually do the medical uh, screenings for how many people, right? That's going to be the point of, of you know, that's going to be the sort of the uh, the choke point, as it were, in all of that process, right? So we're not going to see 10, 15,000 visas suddenly being uh, added uh, or, you know, interviews being added in the next few days. We're not going to see that, right? But that's okay because we've got the preservation order that will come. And that's kind of what Judge Meta is, is thinking, I believe. So I don't want for people to get the impression that because we got this order, there's going to be this sudden flood of, uh, of interview activity and, and all sorts of unusual processes like people getting interviewed when they're not documentarily qualified and all this sort of thing. I don't think those things are going to happen. It, you know, and we can argue, and Curtis sees this differently, I know that. We can argue whether DQ, oh, man. whether documentarily qualified is... Um, Curtis makes the point that there is no part of the law that requires a case to be documentarily qualified in order to um, uh, to be interviewed. Fine, I'm not arguing that, but it's part of their process. And the judge matters uh, judge matters opinion or the order has not changed that part of the process. It refers to using best efforts or you know good faith, um, but it doesn't say you must schedule people who are not documentarily qualified. So I think we need to get a little bit real here about what's actually going to happen. We're not going to see a flood of visas being issued. We're not going to see a flood of interviews being arranged um, in the next couple of weeks. And we are going to have to rely on the preservation order for the majority of the processing uh, in DV 2021, right? I just wanted to make that clear. I'm hoping that that's clear to, to people because otherwise you're going to think you know, you're gonna you're gonna have false expectations, frankly. And you you know, some of you, frankly, just jump to the other side of logic when it comes to you know building a, an image around um, false expectations. It, it, it you know you've got to be realistic. There's um, there's uh, you know there's law, there's process, and some process is allowed to continue, 
And, you know, best efforts doesn't mean drop everything and just do whatever the hell uh, Judge Meta says, right? <laughs> that's not that's not how it works. Um, okay, so so that's that's one thing I wanted to say to, to make clear. The other thing I wanted to deal with is a slightly sort of um, uh, a slightly you know, sort of worrying or troubling. And Luca, actually, Luca, I see you're on. I'm pleased you're on because um, you are a Go plaintiff. And and other people who are Go, Go plaintiffs uh, particularly. So we had Go, we had Good Luck, uh, and we have, and in Good Luck, there are some people who have paid money already and there are other people who have not paid. And there's a lot of people in Good Luck, what, 11,600 cases, right? So, um, so, so I, I've been getting messages. Let me just show you this. I, 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 it's kind of, it kind of frustrates me a little bit, and I wish people didn't think like this, but they do. And I just wanted to sort of address this a little bit. Um, it's this comment I'm talking about. This comment from Anise. I got this this um, comment. This is a Go plaintiff. There are about six or seven hundred uh, Go plaintiffs. About eleven hundred people, I think, uh, something in that range. And, and Anise uh, takes a sort of a negative view saying, uh, yes, it's a win, a win for everyone except us Go plaintiffs. We filed this lawsuit on April 9th, we, 9th, we paid high fees. We're waiting and following updates day by, day by night, blah, blah, blah. And then ask me three questions, right? The three questions uh, are, that are asked are, so can you explain uh, us? I'm just gonna try and read it, it's not great English, but can you explain us why we should be happy about the judgment? Okay. Uh, what was the interest of being named plaintiffs if everyone was the same except paying $2,000? Could you imagine if you were in our situation, what would be your reaction? Right? That's Those are the three questions. And it kind of troubles me that people even think like this. So, um, so the first thing, let me take, and I've answered this already, but I wanted to make the point because, I, you know, this is my perspective. You can see it differently. Um, and you're entitled to your opinion, obviously, and you're the paying customer, as it were. So if you're not happy, if you're a go plaintiff or even a good luck plaintiff, and you're not happy at the moment, well, I'm sorry. Um, but I wanted to explain this. Um, so first question, um, why should we be happy about the judgment? Because it's a win for everybody, including go plaintiffs, right? That's the first thing. It doesn't exclude go plaintiffs. It just didn't give the um, the prioritization that perhaps you might have uh, hoped for. Now that prioritization wasn't promised. Uh, in fact, no, nothing was guaranteed to you. Nobody at any time, as far as I'm aware, certainly you know, neither I nor the lawyers in that case, um, you know, made any promises about prioritization or um, or being guaranteed a visa. So that you know, that shouldn't have been assumed. And if you've assumed that and you're pissed off now, well, sorry, that's your fault, not mine, not not theirs. See what I mean? Um, it, it, but it's a win for everybody, including Go plaintiffs. That's the first part, right? The next, the next question was, you know, what was the interest of being named plaintiffs if everyone is the same? And I answered that, this in a slightly sarcastic way, saying, you know, you're asking someone who has spent the last eight years using his spare time and money to help strangers on the internet. So maybe you should you you should uh, you should ask I, I tell, uh, you know you should be asking a more selfish person for a more satisfying answer. I see this this question as frankly uh, coming from a selfish perspective, and um, you know I can't relate to that. I don't want to relate to that. I don't want to see that sort of negativi negativity in uh, in things. I, I'm someone who looks at a glass of water, you know, a glass with as half full glass of water, not a half empty glass of water, right? And then, um, but this is the more important question. Could you imagine if you're in our situation, what would be your reaction? And I said, I would be thrilled to get help for myself and help others at the same time, right? But as I mentioned in two, you're probably of a different character. So that's the point. Um, uh, and I finished up by saying, you know, this particular person would only have been happy if the Go plaintiffs won and other people lost their chance. That's the only person, that's the only way this person would have been happy, that they were prioritized, meaning other people lost. That, that's, I hope none of you think like that. I think that's a horrible way to, um, you know, to, uh, to think, frankly. Um, you know, so I'm, I'm hoping, and Luke, I'd appreciate your perspective, um, 
you know, I'm hoping people don't think like that, right? Um, but, but at the end of the day, Go plaintiffs and good luck plaintiffs um, have the same results. The, under the Go case, the judge is doing the preservation or planning to do the preservation. He specifically mentions the Go case. Um, but it, uh, but I believe it will probably cover everybody, not just people in the Go, play, Go case. It should cover the Go, good luck people. And I think, you know, he'll either, Luca, you, you put some good points out there earlier. Um, he, the, Unlike last year, where he asked for certain things about other visa classes, he hasn't asked that at this point. He might do. He might do on September 23rd or thereabouts. Um, he may still do some sort of calculation, but you know, otherwise, hopefully, he'll say, "Okay, you've issued 18,000 visas to this point. Uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say you need to issue another 37,000 visas." You know, I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm using an example. I'm not saying those would be the number. But I'm hoping he would take that sort of perspective. Um, okay, so, um, so so yeah, let me know, uh, Luca, if that uh, makes sense, because you have a specific uh, perspective being a go case, and you may have had that sort of immediate reaction yourself, um, and others might have done. But but you know, I'd, I'd be interested in your thoughts. Um, okay, so that's really what I wanted to. Questions are probably coming from an unhappy person generally. Yeah, I think so too. Um, uh, I think you're probably right. And, uh, you know, yeah. <laughs> it's just it's just sad, really. But anyway. Um, okay, so let me see if I can answer a few questions. As I say, the main thing I wanted to do in this live session was explain to, to people to not be too, uh, you know, unhappy if we don't see a flood of 2NLs in the next few days. I do think we're going to see some um, extra 2NLs. Uh, you know, I think there'll be some efforts made in some of the embassies where the embassies will say, okay, yeah, we can we can fit in a few more people this month. Um, but generally speaking, I think most embassies are going to say, you know, okay, you're not, you're not telling us they're tier four now, but we've already got people booked up and the, the physicians have got no capacity. So we're not going to add, you know, many people. Um, so there you go. Um, Right, so let's deal with a couple of practicalities. Shall we start to communicate KCC and embassies in order to push our cases? What shall be the ask? Right, I would say don't do that at the moment in one way. There's two things I want to say about this, communicating with the embassies. And, and um, again, Curtis, uh, and Curtis has, be, has got his knickers in a twist about this um, a little bit. Um, but, but anyway... Um, uh, the thing is, if you imagine the inbox at, um, at KCC today, it's full already. It was already full before the, uh, you know, before the, um, uh, before the order, right? There's a backlog. If you ask anyone in DB 2022 is asking, for example, to unlock their case, or, uh, you know, for DB 2021 people who are emailing to ask something or other about their case, most people will tell you, that there is a backlog, there's a delay in KCC doing anything. So you emailing KCC today about um, about uh, the the judge's order, etc., is it's not going to be seen immediately, right? That's the first thing. Second thing is KCC don't know anything about this order yet, or if they do know about the order, they don't they haven't been instructed how they must act yet, right? So in one sense, it doesn't matter, you know, whether you email them or not. They're not going to see your email for a few days and, um, you know, possibly weeks. Um, and uh, I don't think they're going to be able to go through and search through things. If you do email um, KCC, you should put your case number in there, your full case number. Don't forget, when you email KCC, it's the full case number with the year, the region, the leading zeros, and the number right? All of the case number as was shown on your original um, thing. That should be in the subject line. If you write anything else in the subject line, it does, it's not going to harm your case, which is what was suggested by Curtis and others. Um, it's not going to hurt your case. So if you put in there, go plaintiff, it's not going to harm your case, um, you know, if you put that those two words in there. If you put in uh, something about what you're trying to contact them about in the subject line. It's not really going to um, uh, harm your case at all. It's, it doesn't, you know, they, they've got a lot of emails they're going through. They're not even really looking at the subjects, but they might search for the uh, for the case numbers, right? 
Um, now, uh, then in, in, in the body of any email you send to KCC, do try and be concise. Don't give them a lot of uh, nonsense information they don't need. Don't tell them your, your life history. And I agree with Curtis on this point. You don't want to, um, you don't want to give them lots of uh, extra information they really don't need. Right? Try and be to the point because you want, number one, you want them to be quick in answering your email and you also want them to be quick in answering everybody else's email, but also you don't want to bore them. Uh, they, they have to read through a bunch of emails every day. You, you know, uh, you don't want to bore them. You want to be precise and to the point, make it clear what you want to say. Bullet points, numbered bullet points, and numbered questions are always better. If you see me on my, on my blog where people uh, ask me questions, I always ask for numbered questions, right? KCC very, very rarely respond with um, custom emails, I would say. They've got, they've got, um, they've got responses uh, for almost every email, standard responses. They, they copy and paste from one place to another, and, and they respond. Um, and so, you know, having lots of detailed information and expecting them to understand your life history, um, you know, it's not how it works. It, it's not going to help. Um, Curtis also made the point that, that uh, consular or officers in particular uh, get frustrated with wading through extra information. I think that's probably true. Um, again, be very succinct if you're going to be uh, emailing with the embassies, right? So back to your question, Better Mori, Yahoo, C1. Um, right now, even if you email KCC, they're not going to see it for weeks. So, you know, it's up to you. You can do that if you want to. Um, I told someone yesterday to, uh, you know, he asked, what should I put in my subject? And I, I responded. Um, so you can do that, but I don't think they're going to see it, right? Um, there's, there's less point. If your case is not at, already at the embassy, the embassy doesn't know anything about you, okay? And the embassies can't drive the process. They can't drive the scheduling. They can't reach out to KCC and say, here's Johnny. Johnny's a nice guy. Johnny isn't documentarily qualified, and there's 2,000 people you've got who are documentarily qualified, but we like Johnny, so please schedule Johnny. No, <laughs> that's not how it works. They're, they're going to go through the documentarily qualified um, order um, you know, because that's part of their process. It doesn't matter whether it's law or not. That's what their process is, and the judge has not told them uh, to do anything different, right? So, um, so you know... You can email if you want, but it probably won't make any difference at the moment. Right? We have to be patient in this. And people from TV2020 will tell you that, you know, patience is still important, even though we've got a judge's order, right? Um, no news about Afghanistan yet. I think um, I understand that Islamabad embassy is, is prepared to take some uh, cases, but um, but... You know, realistically, they're not going to cope with lots of cases. So, uh, you know, you have to see how that goes. You know, each of you will need to be fighting for your own cases to an extent. But those of you that um, that have signed up with good luck uh, can also use that team of lawyers to help you with your uh, embassy scheduling because I understand they're doing that. Um, so, you know, you may be able to get some help from them. Otherwise, and anyway, you need to put your own case, right? You need to do whatever you think you need to do. Um, okay. Um, so the news for DV2020. So the, 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 um, uh, the judge is going to rule that the 9,095 visas can be issued. He asked the government and the plaintiff's lawyers to figure out how that could happen. The government made a ridiculous suggestion and said they didn't want to. They didn't want to help. Uh, they didn't want to play. Whatever. Um, and uh, and so Judge Master is now going to have to make a decision, um, and you know, and, and order them to do something based on input from the government and the plaintiffs' lawyers. So we'll have to wait and see how he does that, and when uh, visa reissue, visa issuance can start. Okay. Um, there's some things they need to clear up. Some details they need to clear up. And they'll they'll get to that as soon as they can. It's not Judge Meta's fault that there's a delay. Um, it, the government could have been more cooperative, and we could be in business by now, right? But um, you know, but the government lawyers are a pain in the ass, right? Uh, okay, so Makuts Gaming, that's your question answered. Please don't continue to spam. 
uh, and repeating a question, right? Um, why don't they issue visas for all selectees who are documentarily qualified? I mean, those who are complete documents. Well, um, it's a bit of a, so it's a bit of a weird um, question. Um, you're sort of suggesting that they're not going to do that. I don't, I don't really understand the intent of your question, but um, basically people will have to have an interview anyway. Um, in adjustment of status cases, sometimes we see cases get approved without an interview. I don't think we're going to see that in consular um, processing cases. Um, so, uh, so I don't think they're just going to suddenly say, "Yeah, I'm going to, we're going to issue all of those visas." I, if that's what, what someone's saying, I don't know if somebody's saying that, one of the lawyers or something. But if that's what someone's saying, though, I, I don't think that's going to happen. But you know, who knows? Um, when will 2023 open? It'll open in October. Um, I don't have the exact date yet, and we won't have that date until um, until probably in September, late in September. Um, Brits, I've sent my docs for more than six weeks. They requested certain docs. Uh, no answer from KCC. The docs are not 100% sure. Watch your tutorials and send them again. Yeah. So, Chanel, um, you don't mention whether you're DV 2022 or 21. I uh, wish you had. Um, but um, but anyway, you've sent your documents. If you're DV 2022, then just hang on for now. And if your case number is high, uh, then you're going to have to be patient anyway, right? It will take some time. And the six weeks timeline they're given the, uh, in the emails is bullshit. Um, some people go faster than that, but most people are much, much slower than that. And it really is based on your case number, right? So... Um, so ignore that whole six weeks nonsense. That's just, you know, that's one of many things that KCC say that is not true. Um, uh, hasn't, hasn't KCC finished with DV 2021 scan documents? No, that this order is probably going to make them continue to spend some time on DV 2021. Although how much more they'll do, I don't know. There are already more cases, documentarily qualified cases for DV 2021, already qualified, then there is time to uh, to process in the remainder of this month. Much, much more. Many, many times more, right? Um, so realistically, they don't have to qualify any more cases in order to complete their work in, in September, all right? Um, because they're not planning to issue 55,000 visas. That's not going to happen. doesn't matter what people say uh, that want to be optimistic. That's not going to happen. So, um, uh, you know, so the, the documentarily qualified case is probably too much. Will they continue on that? I don't know. I think it's very obvious, though, that uh, there are few or almost no cases scheduled for DV 2022 in October yet. Um, there was rumor about one particular case that was scheduled on October 3rd. I think that was just nonsense, frankly. Um, I don't believe it was true. Um, and uh, I don't think there are many interviews scheduled in October. But if you are scheduled in October, uh, you know, as a DV2022 case, please feel free to, uh, to let me know. I'd be very interested. But I would also like to see, uh, you know, some evidence, some realistic evidence, i.e. your 2NL, your, your letter of interview notification. Um, and so, you know, I don't think that's happened. Um, it is obvious to me that DV 2022 is going to start slowly. And if the prioritization tier four is kept in place, it will continue slowly. So the whole great thing about the DV 2021 lawsuit is the part of that uh, of that um, order that refers to that that piece of you know brilliance that the government came up came up with of putting DVs in tier four that that part was arbitrary and capricious. There's no justification for it, and so um, I'm hoping the government will actually turn around and remove that tier four bullshit for DV 2022. Right, I hope so. But the order doesn't specifically apply to DV 2022. I'm I'm hoping that the government are going to sort of see some common sense, but they haven't in the past, so I don't know. I don't know how that's going to work. Right? Um, 
I get many, many questions like this of, here's my case number, I'm in this position, do I have a chance? Look, I can't tell you, uh, you chances about your particular case. In general, if you're documentarily qualified, you have more ch chance than someone who isn't. If you were documentarily qualified long ago, you have more chance than someone who isn't. In general, you're more likely to be documentarily qualified if your case number is lower, because even when they've got backlogs, they process by case number order, um, you know, and so on and so forth. There are some obvious statements that we can make, um, but I can't tell you specifically about one particular case or your chances. You just have to wait and see, okay? The, the, and, and there's going to be, I could probably click on 20 other questions, exactly the same sort of questions. How about my case? And the answer is wait and see, right? Yeah, you know, you just have to wait and see what happens. In terms of the prioritization, once we get a preservation order, if we don't get a preservation order that guarantees us up to the 55,000 visas, if it's less than that in total between what's issued and what's reserved, then there should be some, uh, you know, there'll need to be some thought about which cases will be prioritized first. And I suspect because all cases are current, there's two things they could do, basically. Because all cases are current, they could continue to work on voluntarily qualified order as being the, um, the preference. Or they could somehow alter the VB. They could retrograce the numbers and they could say, okay, we've got way too many cases now. So here are new cutoffs for DV 2021 because that's all we're going to do. They could do that. Um, it's technically it's possible. It's called retrogression. And we've seen it before, right? Not after the end of the year, but of course we're in uncharted territory anyway. So I think the former suggestion I just made about documentarily qualified, I think that's more likely to be the way that cases continue to be prioritized after September 30th, whenever uh, processing starts again. But the other, the other way of doing it is possible, technically possible. I think less likely, but possible, okay? Um, okay. I can't force myself, what an interesting question. I can't force myself uh, to follow all the developments and news just waiting. Does it hurt my chances? It kind of does. I've, I'm, I'm sorry to say, I, I, I respect your perspective because some people just get too worked up. There's a guy who asked me the same questions all the time for DB 2020. He just doesn't seem to ever remember uh, that I've asked him to be patient, etc., and I've explained things to him many, many times. And I don't think that's good for his mental health. It's not very good for my mental health, frankly. But uh, but to your point, Ivan, I think you know being constantly obsessing about something uh, that you can't really do anything about is negative. However, there will be I don't know which year you're in or what position you're in, um, but at some point it may be necessary to actually jump on your own case and do something to help yourself, right? And so don't, you know, if you do want to take a mental break from all of this chaos, I totally get that. But I don't know, try and watch out for, uh, you know, at least sort of, at least I should say, at least stay subscribed to my blog and, uh, and watch out for the announcements on that because you may need to jump onto doing something straight away. But yeah, um, I get where you're coming from, Ivan. Um, and you're right in many ways. Um, okay. This is, okay, for 2022, AF 55,000, roughly. Um, if they go by, okay, this, this is probably something I need to explain to people. So uh, in a normal year, your case number is relatively high, right? Which means that you wouldn't normally be expecting to be interviewed until late summer of next year, right? That's what your case number means. Now, uh, it's possible that regions go current. And when regions go current, the, uh, the ordering of cases becomes the date on which the cases were documentarily qualified, right? And, um, and what that has meant is that some cases with very high case numbers have been scheduled in DB 2021 because we went uh, current in all regions pretty early. Now, going current in a region is, is based on how many cases are documentarily qualified. 
And those numbers are supplied to a guy called Charlie Oppenheim, who decides the visa bulletin, and he sets the numbers, right? And he only works from information that he's given from KCC. So last year, and for the last couple of years, the number of people documentarily qualified has been low because KCC screwed the whole thing up and weren't asking people for documents, and people weren't sending in documents, etc. And so there were very few cases documentarily qualified, and therefore Charlie Oppenheim, the guy who decides the numbers, made all the regions current. This year, we've learned so much more about the whole documentarily qualified process and how KCC operate. And we've now, over the last few months, I've changed my advice and other people are, are repeating that advice to say, send in your documents proactively. And it works. We know it works, right? You can send in your documents before being asked for them. And so everybody now understands that sending in your document, I mean, I, I, I say everybody, people that are listening to people like me and others, they understand that sending in your documents is important, right? And so if enough people are sending in their documents proactively and KCC get to the point where they can process enough of those cases, it will make it less likely that all regions will go current. And then case number order is again, much more important, which is actually how it's supposed to work, right? So this whole proactive thing of sending in documents is a double-edged sword. Um, it's going to it's going to mean it's less likely for, for regions to go current this year, because this year, DV 2022, is an over-selected year. So, uh, and at the same time, the number of cases being processed by the embassies will be low unless we can remove that prioritization um, DV, you know, DV visas in being in uh, tier four, right? So all of that, there's too much, too many factors to sort of accurately predict when your embassy is going to, or when you're going to get your interview. But in any case, it's not going to be until, you know, months from now, right? There's no possible scenario. It doesn't matter how fast you send in your documents, you're not getting an interview in December this year or something. It's not going to happen, right? It'll be next summer at the earliest. Um, okay. Um, so this question is, you, you sent in your documents, then you went to Spain and you send a, you stayed in another house, etc., and didn't mention that address. If the, on the day that you sent in your DS-260 before, the information you gave was correct and you didn't list this other address, that's okay, it doesn't matter. Um, if you needed to unlock your case for any other reason, then you should update it with the address that you were at in Spain. You should let them know you were there. But but you don't actually have to unlock to um, to inform them of changes like uh, changing your job, changing your address, and that sort of thing. If you get married or you have a kid, yeah, you need to let them know. That's significant, right? Uh, so you need to unlock and let them know as fast as possible. Um, you know, so there's certain things that are important to, to unlock and let them know about. You could call those things material things. And there, there are other less important things like getting a new job, completing your education, um, you know, uh, living in a different address, etc. The only thing I would say is that you were in a different country um, and you're saying it was for five months, you know, getting close to the point where uh, you stayed in different houses, yeah. So if you were definitely only there for five months, you don't need a, a police certificate for Spain. Um, but, you know, that would be the other thing that travel history is kind of important, um, but not not really for five months, okay? Uh, can I use a SparkGo 2020 cell phone to take a photo for the upcoming DV lottery? I don't know anything about SparkGo 2020, but... Um, uh, but can you take a can you take a um, a photo for the DB lottery entry with a phone? Yeah, you can, as long as it's a reasonable quality um, device and takes a reasonably good quality uh, photo. That's fine, no problem. Um, okay. Uh... Quick question here, uh, DV2022, started your application in the DS260, but I have two kids who are US citizens, meaning they have a US passport. I accidentally added their name while creating a DS260 for them. I have no way to remove it. 
do I need to keep going with the application or get in touch with KCC to remove it? Good question. Um, you can't remove it. Uh, KCC won't remove it, right? They So you've, uh, you've started um, two extra DS260s, as I understand what you're saying, and you can't remove those DS260s, but you don't have to submit them, right? Yeah, so when you submit your own DS260, don't submit those extra ones. On your own DS260, you should list the kids that are citizens, but you uh, answer the questions about whether they need immigration as they're not immigrating with you at this time, right? And therefore, you don't need to have uh, the DS260. And, you know, the the um, uh, the embassy will understand that, KCC will understand that. And, you know, you can, if you want, you can even include uh, the copies of their American passports with your documents and an explanation. So it's absolutely clear why you, uh, you know, why you've not included the kids uh, in this uh, in this application. Does that make sense? I hope so. Um how much time does it take KCC to ask for documents in the 2022 fiscal year? Um, don't wait for them to ask. Why are you waiting for them to ask? For six months, I've been saying, send the bloody documents. Why are you waiting them for them to ask? Don't. Just send the bloody documents, right? And on, if you Google these words, Brit Simon, document, procedure, modification, you'll get to a, uh, to a blog article that I wrote that has all the information and instructions you need of which documents you need, how you should name those documents, how you should name the email, what email address you send it to, and so on. So you don't need them to ask you, um, you know, to send documents. I've given you all the information. What are you waiting for? Get on with it. Um, see, tough love from from me sometimes. <laughs> uh, live in the UK. Like like the UK, recently got my DB twenty twenty one visa. Am I allowed to travel to the US uh, right now? Given that the UK travel ban is still in place, yes, you are. You've got um, an automatic national interest exception um, based on you having an immigrant visa in your in your passport. So yeah, you can travel, and you don't have to go somewhere else for fourteen days and all that nonsense. You can travel directly. Okay, I hope most airlines should understand that. Um, so you, you're you're fine. Um, okay, let me see another question here. I've submitted documents following your guidelines. Good. However, when naming each document, I put it PDF at the end of each document, not realizing the document was saved as a PDF uh, and will have PDF automatically. So it's got PDF, PDF. No, that's not a problem. If you, uh, as long as you've got Adobe Acrobat or a similar sort of PDF reader installed on your computer, you can test this yourself. You can double click on that on that um, on that document, which is a PDF, and it will open in Acrobat because um, applications start from the right hand side and read backwards, so it will only see the last PDF, and it sees the first PDF that you added in. It sees that as part of the name, so no problem. Right, it, it will open up, right? And um, you know, if you don't have Acrobat Reader, I mean, you should have if you're able to create the PDF. Um, so you know, that's all that you need to do. It's no problem. Okay. Um, support of my question. Oh, this is the other question. Yeah. So you asked. Can't remember what you asked, but your AS thirteen thousand. Submitted DS260 in all docs without being asked. Do I receive 2NL and do the other guys like me receive 2NL? Uh, if not, why? I'm a bit confused with all that. But basically, um, your case number is still important. Your 2022, your case number is important. Even though you submitted documents and even, th even though you could get documentarily qualified early, depending on when you sent your documents, um, uh, you know, if you sent them when they had no backlog, they can actually, they can process high case numbers if they've got no other work to do. But if they've got a backlog of work to do, then they go in case number order, right? Um, so, uh, but you won't get a 2NL, and 2NL, to be clear, is your interview notification. You won't get that until your case number is current, right? Um, I hope that's clear. Okay. Um, is AF9K a low number? Yeah, so numbers in, in Africa region in um, 
DB2022 probably go up to about 65,000. So if numbers are between, let's say, one and 65,000, you're at 9,000, that's low, right? It's not hard to work out, people. <laughs> it's like the closer you are to one, the lower your number is, right? Now, all the regions go to different places. Asia is up to about 30,000 for, um, for DB2022. Europe, I think, is, I don't know, I can't remember now, 30-something thousand. Um, and, you know, whereas the smaller regions, Oceania and South America, have much lower numbers. Oceania, for example, the highest case number uh, that I know of is under 2,500, right? So, um, you know, 2,450 in Oceania is a high number, whereas your number is low because it's compared to the highest number of 65,000. That's how it works. Okay, um, it's funny people ask, is my number high or low, but they don't really understand what it means. Um, Nizar, do I have to wait for the email to send the documents or send them without receiving the me email? I wait for your answer, please. What's the answer, everybody? Send the documents. Send the bloody documents. Just, just send the documents. Please just send the documents. So I can stop saying send the bloody documents. Uh, how come it's the same case number at different region? AS 5566 and AS 5544. <laughs> um, okay, the first thing is those two numbers aren't the same number, but I think I take your point. Your, your point, I think you're asking is, can I have um, a case number AS 10 and Africa 10 and EU 10? Yeah, you can have that because all of the regions have their own lottery process and they all start at one in their own region, right? It's not like number one goes to Europe and then number two goes to Africa. It's Africa gets number one, two, three, four, five, right? And all the numbers down. And Europe gets one, two, three, four, five, and all the numbers down, et cetera. And so does Asia and so on, right? And so, yes, clearly there can be a the same numeric number uh, used in more than one region and probably all the regions, right? AS, AS1, EU1, uh, you know, Africa1, Oceania1, and so on. That All those numbers existed at some point. Um, so, yeah, that's they can. Um, uh, Codorosity or something. So you got the last response was the case number is now current for interview processing, embassy in Georgia. Thoughts on this? Okay. In previous years, whenever someone saw that response, which is a very specific response from KCC, it meant that the KCC are actively right then trying to schedule your case and you could expect your 2NL within uh, a few days or a week or two, right? It literally meant that. I mean, it was a very rare email that people received only at a very specific time uh, when their case was essentially already um, scheduled for interview, but you hadn't been informed yet. However, now, because there are because of the priority um, uh, tier four thing, um, the way it works is that you could have you could have 500 people who are documentarily qualified for a specific embassy. But the embassy is only accepting 50, um, 50 interviews a month, right? And so it's going to take them a long time to go through those 500 cases. And so because of that, while you're waiting for your, for your turn in that 500, um, you'll get that email. And it's much more likely that people are seeing that email saying you're current for interview processing. And um, the, the bad news is that the order in which those cases are um, scheduled dep you know, depends, obviously, it depends on the capacity of the embassy, first and foremost, as to how many of those they can take. But the order in which they're, they're scheduled is based on the day on which you became documentarily qualified. Okay? So, um, you know, so that's, that's how it works, right? Georgia, I don't know how much that I, I don't know from the top of my head what their capacity is each month or how they're doing with scheduling. But there may be more people in Georgia ahead of you uh, that were documentarily qualified ahead of you, even with case numbers higher than you, that would be 
more, you know, would be more likely to get a, an interview than you. And of course, we're talking about you know, this on September the 10th. There's only three weeks of the month left, not even. Um, and so, you know, there's little chance of you being interviewed by the end of the month. And so really, you're the preservation of, of visas order is what you should be concerned with. Okay. Is there a way to take your fiance with you without marrying legally? If your fiance is very, very small, they might fit in a sm small suitcase or something. But other than that, no, there isn't. Uh, <laughs> I'm being silly, of course. There, there, isn't, um, there isn't a way to include a fiance, a non-married fiance, on your case. Uh, in order to apply for a visa for them, for a green card for them, you have to get married. What's your problem? Get married. Come on, dude. Uh, Influences mind. Get married. Be nice. Um, <laughs> thanks, buddy. Yeah. Some people don't like my style, but yeah, my style is just brutal honesty sometimes. So, you know, that's just the way I see life. Um, how... Uh, want to apply for green card lottery visa. Funnily enough, I have pages and pages of helpful guides and videos to help you. Go and have a look at my video channel. Uh, already answered that one. Um, and you, for some reason, Ahmed, you've repeated that a hundred more times. I, I'm not sure why, um, but please stop doing that. Uh, 2021 AS24K. Do I have a chance or that's it? I don't understand people that are... Uh, so sort of negative minded that they're, you know, Judge Mater just issued a ruling that basically said we've won and that the government have uh, have done a bunch of things wrong and he's going to he's going to protect the rights of the uh, of the visas. And it's a really good judgment. And it hints to the fact that we're going to get a preservation order uh, later. It's really, really good news. It should be really exciting. And you're like, oh, it's all over. Oh, my life is over. Like, Come on, be happy. There's good news here. Stop being so sad. Cheer up. It couldn't, I mean, I don't know what you thought was going to happen. You know, maybe you were expecting fireworks, but honestly, it's, uh, this is a brilliant result. You should be very, very happy with this result. Uh, and so stop being so sad, right? You got a chance. Everyone's got a chance. That's the thing. Um, oh, here we go. One, that's, one that starts, I read an article. Uh, let's see what it says. I read an article and it said the Department of State is no longer going to prioritize some tiers over others. All tiers are getting an interview within the month. Within the month. <laughs> there are 547,000 people who are documentarily qualified in various um, cases. 547,000 people uh, around the world, right? In various types of visas. Um, I mean, they're all going to get done within a month. Hmm. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. So, uh, well, when I say I'm not sure, I mean, no, that's utter bullshit. Um, no. I don't know what, what article you're reading, um, you know, but you should probably read better articles, to be honest with you. Um, Pramila Basnet, uh, case number is AS, AS21 from Nepal. Is there any chance for me or not? Bingo, that's another one. Is there a chance for my particular case? I don't know. <laughs> Hamid says it's a different question. Is it really, though? It seems to be the same question. So let me have a look. I went to Spain in 2020 for five months, and in 2021 for three months. Oh, I see why it's different. Yeah. Uh, should I have a police certificate from Spain? Didn't mention it because, okay. It sounds like it sounds like you submitted your, I, I can't remember, are you 2022 or 21? I'm not sure. But um, when someone... So, so firstly, the rule is this: you are you're required to provide uh, provide a police certificate for a country that you're currently living in um, from six months and onwards, right? From a country that you previously lived in, it's from twelve months and onwards. But you have to look at it from the consular officer's point of view. If you were there for five months in one trip and three months in another trip, that's jointly that's eight months. But how does he know that you left in between, right? So if there's any concern or suspicion or you can't actually prove that it wasn't five months and three days this time and three months and two days this time, and, you know, if you can't prove that precisely, then go ahead and get the bloody police certificate. Why not, right? Just submit it. 
Um, and the other part of this is I said earlier that um, on the day you submitted your DS-260, it should have been accurate. If, in fact, you did not make that accurate, that you left off uh, a place, you know, you'd been in Spain, etc., from your travel or your address history, then that's a problem. You need to be honest in this process. You need to correct that if you left that information off. And the fact that you were there over two periods, that tells me you may have submitted your DS-260 after the point when you'd been in Spain and you didn't tell them you'd been in Spain. Why not? That seems like you're trying to hide something, right? And you don't want to give that impression. So be honest, be transparent, and if necessary, correct your, uh, correct your DS-260, okay? So there you go. I do agree it was a different question, slightly. Um, okay, Hernan. Uh, completed the DS-260 on May 26th and sent ci civil, civil documents on August 14th. No response. Is that a normal delay? Pretty much. Um, so, uh, yeah, sort of. So basically, in the, they've been spending most of their time on DB2021. I don't think they've done very much on DB2022. Um, and so, you know, you, it could be that your documents will take a bit of time. Your case number is not very high in South America. Um, so I don't know, you know. Hopefully they'll get to it soon, but do go back and check which documents you sent, whether you sent the documents correctly, whether you named the, um, the it's very important, I've pointed out before, the subject line of the email you send to KCC documents should have your case number in there, nothing before your case number for sure, and your case number needs to have the leading zeros. If you haven't followed those instructions, you could have put your uh, your your email down in the email box. You could have delayed your own case. So be very careful with how you uh, put the subject line of the um, of the email that you sent. Okay. Um, okay. Um, by good luck and grace, is that a pun? Good luck. By good luck and grace, I win. What are the things I expect to pay for? And is it true that the, gov the U.S. government puts out specific all allocations? And I have to pay for everything immediately. <laughs> um, what do you mean? Okay, so so let me let me cover cover the expenses for the process. Firstly, the first thing I want to clear up: some people have asked me in the past. This one always cracks me up. Is you know how will the government pay for my um, for my flight, or where will the government put me when I arrive? Um, they don't do any of that. This is an opportunity. It's not a free ride. Right, you you have to pay for all of your living expenses and everything else, and you have to pay for those things from the beginning. And in fact, if you rent a, an apartment, for example, in the USA, you'll find that someone will want the rent paid in advance and a deposit, uh, and it's expensive, right? So you have to be aware of that and prepared for that, um, and you'll pay everything. In terms of the fees, the way that you pay the fees, you don't pay any fees to enter. You don't pay any fees prior to the interview in terms of the fees you know, for the interview. You pay $330 US per person, including children from any age at the interview for, you know, for the interview process yourself. You also will pay for the medical, which you normally have done before the interview, and you pay that and, and the price for that varies in various countries. And then once you've been approved after the interview, um, you have to pay another fee, which is $220 per person to produce the plastic green card that you uh, that you prize so much, right? So it's expensive. If you've got a family and you're coming from a you know, country that where, you know, that sounds like a lot of money. It is a lot of money. I get that. But it's not a lot of money compared to American wages and that sort of thing. So you have to try and find some way of affording those things. But because those things are so expensive, Please be honest in the process. Be realistic about whether you're going to get, um, uh, you know, processed and approved or not. If you've lied in the process, if you don't meet the educational standards or the work experience standard or something, something along those lines, and you're going to get denied, if that, if those fees being lost would affect your life negatively, then be very honest with yourself about whether you're going to be approved or not. Right. Um, so, so there you go. 
and yeah, and everything is paid immediately, as you put it. But it's not immediately, you know, as I say, you don't pay for the interview fees until the day of interview. So it's not like you win and then you have to pay lots of money the next day. It's not like that. Um, any plans to visit Atlanta, Georgia? I love Atlanta, actually. Um, Buckhead region, etc. I do love uh, Atlanta. I, I know I'm going. I'm starting to travel now for work. Um, I'm going to Las Vegas in a couple of weeks time um, on a business trip. Um, and I'll, I'll probably start traveling more next year. Um, but uh, so if I do get on the road a little bit, I'll I'll have a I'll announce that and um, you know maybe we can have a cup of tea together, Krishna. All right. Um, I married traditionally and not by ordinance. Any advice for me? Yeah, get married civilly, right? Legally. Um, that's the first thing. In some countries, traditional marriage carries the same uh, same legal rights as a civil marriage, right? In other countries, it doesn't. Um, but from an American point of view, in the immigration process, they will recognize a civil marriage, uh, sorry, a, a traditional marriage sometimes. But the smart thing to do is if there is a civil marriage and traditional marriage process in your country, get the civil marriage done, right? Get the legal marriage done um, so that you can cover both bases, right? Uh, that's the best way forward for that. Okay, everybody, I think that's probably about um, all I should do now. Um, I think I've covered most questions today. I hope that was help, helpful for you. And, uh, oh, my dog's, dog's going nuts. Um, but, yeah, uh, I'll see you over the next few days. Good luck with everything, and I hope everything was clear. All right. Bye-bye.